We are raising our children to become repressed and atomized slaves rather than upright and free human beings. This is a multifaceted problem that I want to unpack here. You see, this channel is dedicated to high culture, to human flourishing, and there are some big problems blocking us from that in modernity. Number one being the economy. The real source of all of our modern ills is that we have placed the economy at the center of our society, along with a central banking system designed to create debt slaves. But we won't go there right now. In essence, the economy, the making and selling of goods and services, is the god of modernity, and this undermines everything. People are so passionate about supporting or hating capitalism, communism, socialism, and whatever the hell they think about economic policy. But even thinking in this way is the problem. Trying to legislate utopia through economic policy is a very modern perspective that will only lead to chaos and decadence. Every great culture, and every great human being for that matter, asks big questions. What is God? What is good? Who am I? What is my soul? What is the purpose and meaning of existence? And the answers to these questions, they put at the very center of their lives and at the very center of culture and society. And as a result, something unique and individuated and strong emerged. Today, we have removed the big questions away from society altogether and simply have put political and economic concerns at the center. And of course, this is going to lead to this nihilistic, meaningless, and hedonistic world that we see today. You see, when you put economic concerns at the top of the hierarchy, it means you are lacking connection to the metaphysical, the natural, and the communal world. When you're lacking connection, of course money is all you're going to care about. And of course money is going to corrupt everything. Basically what's happened in the past couple of hundred years is a slow takeover of the, of the top of society by the merchant caste, by those really concerned with banking and the buying and selling of goods. Now, as this has happened, the ideals of society rapidly change. It's like the great man today is not the man of incredible character. It is the man of incredible wealth. I don't know of any ideal that could be more pathetic to me. In the rest of this video, I want to dive into three outcroppings from this problem. One being education as a means of producing economic units. Two, moral utilitarianism, which is a massive problem and widespread right now. And number three is going to be the surveillance slave state that starts in early childhood. Let's dive into it. For Gen Z and a lot of the younger generations out there, the moment you enter kindergarten or first grade, you're getting groomed for college. You hear from your parents, you hear from your teachers. College is God-tier importance. And I remember for me, I remember telling my dad in fourth grade that I want to go to the best school in the world. And I was an ambitious young lad, but all of my ambition for my creative pursuits, for my inventions, for my adventuring and exploring of the world, everything else just got chipped away for that one thing that was God to your importance and that's getting into a good school. And this really takes over your life once you get into high school. In my high school, over 100 students graduated with a 4.0 or higher or perfect grades plus advanced placement classes. And of course, me being your infamous and illustrious wisdom warrior here, I graduated number one. But it was a grinder of stress for everyone. Most people woke up too early, went to school for eight hours, played a sport for two to three hours, and then went straight home for a few hours of homework, only to repeat it again in the morning. I mean, the average life of a good student at my school was worse than being an indentured servant. It was essentially slavery until 18, and I don't exaggerate. Stress and sleeplessness and anxiety were marks of pride for most people. And everything else in life was subordinate to crafting a good college application. I had friends who were only allowed to hang out on Friday night and sometimes Saturday. This is insane. They had so little freedom. I mean, their parents tracked their phone. Their schools tracked their motions through the hallway. They weren't allowed to leave class without a pass. The sports coaches and everyone was just forcing them to always conform, to always be obedient, to always live their lives within these navigation routes. And this is the opposite of childhood. No wonder people are so easily mind controlled and obedient and conformist today. They never had childhoods. Okay, I'm getting off on a tangent. We'll come back to the surveillance slave state soon. 
College is even worse. College isn't about the earnest pursuit of higher knowledge and learning and discovery. It's about getting a piece of paper for your job. Everything is subject to the first principle of a nation, and ours is materialism and economic security. I had a question for you. How much of high school do you actually remember? How much of your college classes stuck with you? Probably 99% of it we could do away with. And that's radical. People are like, oh, you learn how to work hard and you learn good study habits and blah, blah, blah. It's like we could teach those in a way different way than all of this meaningless bullshit of jumping through hoops to get a piece of paper. Almost all of it is completely unnecessary. It would be way more efficient and healthy to teach kids the basics, have them scout and play outside most of each day, and flame whatever interests they have, and then hire people based off aptitude, character traits, and IQ tests. But that's a video for another time. I don't think we can just change the education system, although I definitely hope this is a future outcome. Ultimately, this isn't a problem with institutions. The education system is an outcropping of our culture, specifically the materialistic and merchant caste values of modernity. Part three, the utilitarian moral perspective. What is good? All that decreases general suffering and that which increases general happiness. From this perspective, you can make an argument for fighting extreme poverty, reducing animal suffering, fixing the homeless problem. And honestly, this makes sense. It's a perfectly logical approach to life. Let's decrease suffering and increase happiness. But this is also the morality of a child. If hurt, bad. If feel good, good. And this childlike moral outlook which the West has adopted has a major flaw. It lacks ideals. It lacks the affirmation of suffering towards a worthy cause. From a utilitarian moral perspective, you can make the argument for feeding everyone Soma, like in the brave new world, or removing all differences that differentiate people, like in the book The Giver. Remove all differences, remove all uncomfortable and unpleasant experiences, remove heartbreak, remove inequality of beauty, of status, of success, of intelligence, and boom, you have a perfectly equal world where no one has to deal with misery or envy or pain. There's a pill for everything and the general baseline of happiness is elevated, but also the ceiling of human potential and the zest and power of life also decrease as you see in the book, The Brave New World and The Giver. These are great warnings for the modern West. When the utilitarian goal of maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering takes precedence, there's a great risk of catering to the lowest common denominator. Society becomes wholly concerned with the bottoms, with the dregs of people, while failing to give men as a whole a meaningful ideal to strive towards. Through utilitarianism, you often get the elevation of mere life into the purpose and reason for existence. Instead of celebrating excellence and self-actualization and lofty ideals that culture is shooting towards, a utilitarian moral perspective often elevates mediocrity and the common man into the ideal. This kind of moral perspective can only come from materialism that has removed the big questions away from the center of culture. If you are living only for the material world, of course thoughts of suffering and pleasure will dominate you. You are like a puny worm. Think about utilitarianism inside yourself. Why shoot to become a world-class boxer if that would entail so much suffering and unpleasantness? Why not just seek to remove the desire for more and make your life more pleasant? Become a neo-Buddhist and retreat to your vegan garden of passivity. And while you're there, just try to fix all the suffering in the world as something unnecessary because suffering is bad in and of itself, right? These neo-Buddhists and utilitarians try to create the perfect Marxist world whether they know it or not. And in their ideal, everyone would fish in the morning and do finger painting art in the evening and all of them would have their bellies full like a goddamn nursing home. Everyone is taking their soma, is pacified and pleasant, but I'd be bored out of my mind along with every human being with a higher taste and higher potential for life. When you seek to minimize suffering and discomfort in life, you also minimize joy and the powerful experiences in life. The floor and the ceiling are relative. This was a deep insight that Friedrich Nietzsche had, one of our favorite philosophers here, that the greatest pleasure and the greatest pain are inseparable. 
It's like love. The experience of falling in love is the juiciest thing of life. And the experience of falling from a great height of love breaks your heart in the worst possible way. But this is also the juiciest part of life. It's like the Carl Jung quote, the tree's branches can only reach to heaven when its roots reach into hell. Nietzsche saw that the maximum of love comes with the maximum of grief, that the maximum of pleasure comes with the maximum of pain. And he wished for his higher men and women to affirm these things, to affirm the suffering in life as something beautiful and something meaningful and seek to rise above it. In fact, for all of his brave higher men and women out there, Questions of pain and pleasure should never be primary concerns. They were of secondary importance if they were important at all. A great man lives for the higher spiritual truth or a great destiny and acts in a way to make his life into a masterpiece of living art. This is the vitalistic path through life, not looking down and trying to oh, how can I get through life with maximum pleasure and minimum suffering or minimizing the suffering of everyone else? It's like, no, how about we affirm life by turning it into something beautiful, by turning my life into something beautiful because we're gonna suffer either way. A quick note to all the humanitarians out there that believe they can decrease the suffering in the world and this is a noble cause. To some measure, I agree with you. Let's get animals out of their factory farmed pens and help deliver food to people in need. For sure. But don't delude yourself. Suffering is a relative thing and will always exist in the world. There's a reason that white American males, the most privileged demographic in history, commit suicide more than any other people's. It's amazing. The people who claim to be the most humanitarian tend to be the most narcissistic and arrogant. I've had so many people comment on my videos, what do you know about suffering in their condescending tones? And it's like, yo, I spent seven years there at rock bottom basically homeless, going through acute addictions, losing people and things I love, you know, totally isolated from everything and everyone. It's probably one of the worst forms of suffering you can endure. And I get people have endured worse, but who's to say that your suffering is any worse than mine? And the bottom line is being a human is hard. We're all going to go through things. We're going to age, break our hearts, be lonely, lose things we love, lose our physical health. Like, no one can fix that or change that about life. It's time we stop trying to fix suffering and start affirming it. So in this, Friedrich Nietzsche encouraged all higher souls to live for something greater than themselves, to make their lives into a piece of living art, to take the vitalistic path through life and not be so concerned about avoiding this little discomfort, avoiding this little piece of suffering, maximizing this pleasure. Pleasure, it doesn't matter. Amor fati, my companions. To love one's fate, to love the pleasure, to love the suffering, to love whatever comes to you and stop trying to fix life, but affirm life. Use life as your platform to live into beauty. That is is the anti-utilitarian moral perspective. That is the vitalistic moral perspective. Part four, safety and the surveillance slave state. When you have a utilitarian moral perspective, of course you want more safety. Safety is a good thing, right? The preservation of mere life. Safety, equality, kindness. These are the values of our primary schools and the primary values of our culture. Almost all ancient peoples would have seen this as laughable, the exact recipe to create weak men. Hey now, I think kindness and empathy, these things are generally good. Like we should have them to some degree or else you're a psychopath. But I also don't think they should be the top qualities, the top virtues of our entire culture. And the only thing we teach to our boys and sons. All I'm saying here is that the other values of courage, of manliness, of aspiration, these things barely get mentioned anymore. I would wager that these are far more important for living a flourishing life and overcoming all the things that hold you back. And since we lack the more masculine virtues, people willingly trade their freedoms for more safeties. And this is happening on every level of society. And this is especially destroying our kids. To all the parents out there, I'm not a parent. I'm not going to tell you how to parent, but maybe you should consider having a few more kids. That way you're not so concerned with losing a couple. <laughs> My friends, I think we are breeding cowardice in our sons because we're always trying to keep them safe. 
This is a huge danger. You see, the surveillance slave state starts with how parents are raising their kids, and then it goes into Big Brother who's watching you right now. Starting about the age of three or four, I basically had free range of the forests, swamps, and creeks around the Mississippi River. I grew up with my mom there all summer, and as long as I had my life jacket on, and I came when she whistled, I could do whatever I wanted. I fished, I caught snakes, I built forts, I'd be gone all day on adventures. By seven years old, my parents might see me once or twice before dinner. Most five-year-olds I see today can't even be in a room alone, let alone separated from their mom for more than 30 minutes. They barely ever leave supervision. When 100 years ago, boys were terrors of the entire city and neighborhoods, running around in gangs and bike gangs and getting in fights and exploring the entire known world. Not anymore. Surveillance is the new norm. Surveillance and chronic safety. Big government spies on adults, adults spy on each other, and parents spy on their children, all in the name of safety, control, and conformity. Is this the new god we worship? The god of safety? No wonder the global slave state is implemented so easily. Thomas Jefferson once said, They that give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. It's time for people to be courageous again. Because here's the thing, freedom is dangerous and freedom must be protected, even if it means the chance of loss. And America was only the land of the free when it was the home of the brave. We have to start being brave again, brave in how we conduct ourselves, brave in how we raise our children, because only through bravery can we actually have freedom. And freedom is the only way to create real citizens, to create real men, to create real masculinity, is this thing can't be taught in these vice scripts of these over-feminized and safe places like school and like your mom's basement. Men need to go explore the world to again, to get hurt, maybe to get in a fight, to go explore the undergrowth of the swamps and the dark places of the city, you know, and like band together and figure out this life thing. I think men used to be courageous because they were allowed to be boys. They were free roaming the forest, the streets, the cities. Some of them died. Some of them got in fights, but many of them grew up to be more self-reliant and courageous than anything we see today. Now we enjoy preparing our sons to be docile and obedient slaves right from the get-go, and we wonder why the majority of the West is miserable. Fuck surveillance. This is killing our children. For most kids today, their entire life is regimented. Their mom tracks their phone. They don't go out and party anymore. They don't go out and explore the world anymore. They get on a bus that brings them right to school. They go home or they go to their sports practices and their coaches are telling them exactly what to do. And then they go home and their parents are telling them what to do. And it's like in this culture, where's the self-agency? Where's the opportunity for mistakes? Where's the opportunity for freedom, for actually being a child? We need to give childhood back to our sons. We need to give childhood back to our daughters. Stop putting them in these school rooms. Let them go scout. Let them go adventure for more than half the day. Most of the education we teach is bullshit anyway. It goes one in one year and out the other. All of this is so inefficient. It's so unnecessary and it's crippling everything. It's crippling everyone. It's turning us into miserable slaves instead of upright and free human beings. Thanks for watching Wisdom Warriors. I'm Christian. Another passionate rant there. I'm trying to spread this message shouting from the rooftop. So please like this video and send it to someone you think will impact. If you're a man out there, a leader, a builder, you know, an entrepreneur, I'm looking for guys like you. I'm trying to rally the troops and get some like-minded, you know, individuals together in this men's community online, the Men's Academy. It's a really great place, impactful mastermind. We have calls every single week. If this seems like something you're interested in, there's a link below to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about that. It's growing real quickly. Would love to have you there. If that's not for you, you can click here for my last video on about the weakness in masculinity and the cult of weak feelings. See you over there. Peace.